So, uh, as as Liz said, I'm I'm Sebastian Ruth. I am in Providence, Rhode Island, and I run an organization here called Community Music Works. And I've just kind of three chapters of uh, of things to share this evening. The first is just an overview of of Community Music Works and what we do and kind of what our operating principles are, as well as some of the inspirations for it. Um, I'll share a little bit about my journey to this work and and then uh, give a little bit of a, a sense of the current moment in our in our work and some of the questions we're asking ourselves right now. So, and then I will look forward to our discussion together at the end. We'll save plenty of time for for conversation at the end. Is everyone seeing the slides okay? Is this visible and great. So Community Music Works is based in a storefront in the West End neighborhood of Providence. And since our beginning, the, the project has really been about positioning a professional ensemble of string players in a space that is figuratively and literally accessible, ground level, and visible to the life of a community. Uh, one of my inspirations in starting Community Music Works was hearing a radio broadcast about Bill Strickland in Pittsburgh, who is the founder of the Manchester Craftsman's Guild. And Bill's founding story really kind of planted a seed for me. And that was being a ceramics practitioner and student and knowing the critical role that art and particularly ceramics played in his life as a student, he was doing, uh, he was doing his work in, a, in the basement of his home and in the Manchester neighborhood of Pittsburgh. And a group of young men were hanging out on the street on a daily basis. And at some point he said, you know, why don't you come down to my basement and I'll show you what I do. And we'll, we'll practice this together. And together this, this group of young people and Bill decided to form a craftsman's guild. And there was something about the nature of invitation that was so inspiring to me, right? He wasn't saying, come, come on kids, this is going to be good for you. You've got to do art because it was good for me. He was saying, I'm doing this. I'm passionate about it. And I'd like to share this with you. And together we might discover something, but all of us are going to be artists here. And there was also something in the, in the premise that he wasn't going to stop doing to teach. He was going to teach by having people look over his shoulder and he didn't claim mastery. He claimed to be a ongoing student of the, of the art form. So I, I was graduating college and no, knowing I wanted to be a, a string player uh, and a chamber musician and an educator. And yet I wasn't so sure I uh, wanted to go the, uh, into the spaces and into the, the pathways of professional musicianing. Uh, specifically, I was interested in how education and the arts and how an arts practice can be an opportunity for uh, in, in engagement with the questions of social change and social action. And uh, so launched, launched Community Music Works. And I can tell a little bit more about the early years in, in a bit. One of my mentors and, um, and inspirations was the philosopher Maxine Green, who taught for many decades of her career at Teachers College at Columbia, and who inspired many, many arts teachers and artists. 
And in her 1995 book called Releasing the Imagination, I came across this quote and it was another wake up call for me. And she said, I hope there, there exists and that I can speak to a community of educators committed to emancipatory pedagogy, particularly in the domain of the arts. I hope that there exists and that I can speak to a community of educators committed to emancipatory pedagogy, particularly in the domain of the arts. And this was, a, this was an essay adapted from a talk she gave to teachers, but it was really, again, it was an invitation. It was saying this field of emancipatory pedagogy or, or education for freedom or education for liberation was a field really uh, developed by and inhabited by teachers who were teaching maybe social studies or history or um, critical consciousness in studying the events of the day, politics, um, social structures. And Maxine Green said, I hope there's a community of us who are committed to these ideas, but in the, in the arts, right? How are, how are the arts an opportunity for young people and adults to move toward greater freedom in, in the way they move in the world? So that was another inspiration. So the elements of the organization that we created since 1987 involve an ensemble in residence. As you saw in the first slide, one of our storefronts there on Westminster Street says string quartet on it. When we began the ambition and the reality for many years was that we would develop a quartet residency out of the storefront. Uh, and in the last maybe 10 or 12 years that has expanded to be a larger, more flexible ensemble in residence with 15 of us who are playing in different combinations from duos to string quartets to string orchestras. And we have a series of you know, 20 or 25 concerts around the city uh, each year. And of course, a core element is the lessons with young people in the community. And there are about 150 young people who study violin, viola and cello uh, their lessons are free, their instruments are free after a $10 registration, annual, annual registration fee. And the young people play in ensembles, uh, ranging from, as you see here, a large ensemble of strings uh, to smaller classes where they might be learning improvisation or songwriting or theory, or in the case of our teens, chamber music and the students are performing in performances for the community in various ways uh, throughout the year. One of the elements of the program is really like Bill Strickland's vision, constantly thinking about how we are colleagues with our students and how we are in, in a shared endeavor. So one of the ways that really comes together in a really exciting way is when we've commissioned works for Community Music Works and for a combined ensemble of young people and professionals. And in this case, as with others, uh, having those commissions feature guest artists. So this is John D. Gandelsman, violinist, uh, maybe known to many of you uh, as, a, as a solo violinist, as a member of the Brooklyn Rider Quartet and the Silk Road Ensemble. And Johnny came to us with a, an idea at, at some point after some other collaborations that he wanted to commission violin concertos that were specific to different musical and cultural traditions. And the first one out of the gate was a violin concerto based in salsa music. And since more than half of our students come from Latin American backgrounds where salsa is a huge part of home culture and music um, that, uh, that we decided this could be a really fun shared endeavor. Um, so this was a, 
picture of Johnny and Heather working through the score in, in a first reading. Zooming out I, again a little bit to the inspiration. When we think about CMW, it is certainly about performance and it is certainly about education and the possibilities that can come from both. But this broader mission um, has always been part of the experiment, part of the um, impetus at that as John Dewey says here in a, in a book called Art as Experience, his kind of treatise um, of philosophy of, of art from 1934, says the project, his project was to restore continuity between the refined and intensified forms of experience that are works of art and the everyday events, doings and sufferings that are universally recognized to constitute experience to restore continuity between the intensified forms of experience that are works of art and the everyday events that are recognized to constitute experience. So Dewey was writing this, this essay in, in 1934 saying, how does a philosopher come up with a theory of art and what art is? And, he, and in the first pages of the essay, he said, one thing we can't do is start with museums and concert halls and theaters and opera houses because those aren't actually the root of what art is and what artists, how art serves people. We have to go back to how art has actually always been this integral part of everyday life. And, and the impetus to make art comes from the everyday sort of human experience of, of everyday life. And so in the 30s, He's, he's writing this and he's saying, you know, um, museums are often a complicated, complicated project, right? They're, they're nationalistic and they're imperialistic and they're showing off their exploits of, you know, who, who has the biggest encyclopedic collection of art from all over the world. But that's not actually the, the, the root of what art is, is, is right? And, and then we go to these places and there's these other layers of formality and patronage and, um, uh, and trying to keep themselves alive by uh, appealing to, to the wealthy in any particular community. And he said that we have to set those aside as maybe necessary, but, but separate things from, from what the experience of art is really about. Um, and uh, I didn't know this quote when we started CMW, I didn't know this text, but it was certainly an inspiration and, uh, and part of the life work of Maxine Green, um, whom I had been reading. But when I found this quote, I thought, yeah, that's exactly it, right? We're trying to, we're trying to just connect this thing, which is kind of rarefied in, in, in the ways that Liz said in, in, in setting this up, right? There's this cloistered um, quality of training to be a musician. And then there's the everyday life that how does how do these things integrate? And I thought, yeah, that's that's really the project. <clears throat> uh, one other thing to note ab about the '30s that that I'm always kind of delighted by is John Dewey was making speeches about you know lectures about art in these in these early years of the early '30s, and some of the people charged with setting up FDRs. Uh, New Deal programs were going to John Dewey's lectures. And so when FDR said, yeah, it's got to be about the New Deal is about putting everyone back to work, building roads and bridges and, and infrastructure. But actually, let's think about the arts too. Like, how are we putting artists back to work? So tap some people to, to figure out the, F, the, uh, the WPA programs in the arts. And those folks were going and hearing John Dewey. So they turned around and started setting up these projects like the mural projects and some of the WPA murals are familiar to us still like in post offices and and libraries you know like let's get muralists to just make art in public spaces but at least what was lesser known to me was these community arts centers that got set up in the WPA um, civic orchestras that got set up in the WPA some of some of which are still in existence um, uh, Walker Art Center was was from that era, and uh, and then 
like cool weird projects like an art van and instead of a museum they they just like put a bunch of paintings in a in a panel van and drove it around and like hung the paintings on the outside of the van and parked it someplace and it was like a walk-up museum so i love that there were these ways that john dewey's ideas took root in the 30s um, and here's a few slides of just how we try to kind of continue to animate those ideas uh, with kind of sidewalk gatherings and festivals and concerts outside of our storefront in, in Providence. Uh, sometimes pop-up style performances. This is in a little deli around the corner from our office, uh, a group of our colleagues from, from several years ago. And our st students and alums sort of taken up the mantle too. Again, along the lines of a dual practice, you know, young people joining us in our practice. This is actually uh, an alumni quartet from a few years ago that called themselves the Rhode Island Latino String Quartet. And we're taking gigs that came, came in either to CMW that we passed along to them or ones they sought out themselves. But this was a neighborhood uh, fruit seller who set up his wares uh, right down the block from us and they kind of jamming out on the street. Uh, to this partner, partnerships with local institutions that might be unlikely places for a partnership with a string ensemble, but um, Nonetheless, where we kind of find find shared interests. This is a taqueria um, about half a mile down the street from CMW called La Lupita Taqueria. And uh, they have a tagline that says authentic Mexican cuisine for every comfort level, um, meaning you can go in and if all, all you know about Mexican cuisine is a taco and a burrito, they've got great tacos and burritos. And if you come in really knowing the cuisine and wanting tripe or something else, they do that well too, right? So we did a concert series uh, over the course of a couple years with them and put a parallel poster up and said classical music, authentic classical music for every comfort level, which means if you've come to this concert because you're seeking classical music, great, this is gonna be a great experience for you. And if you've come for a burrito and you happen upon a string quartet, like, that's going to work for us too. You know, let's do that. Um, and we eventually um, brought guest artists along to the Taqueria because it was just such a such a cool partnership. And Emmanuel Axe visited us for the twentieth season of CMW to help us celebrate the twentieth season. Uh, he claimed he had never played an electric keyboard in public, but was totally game to do it. And uh, and so yeah, we set up this. Piano quintet, informal concert in the corner of the taqueria, and um, they continued to call out the order numbers while while we were playing. Like right? there was this sort of really fun way that we were not shutting down the taqueria or stopping the activity of the walk-in customers, but we did set up chairs, and the place was full of people who were like coming to see Emmanuel Axe, and some people were coming just to find their dinner that night. So. Those are, are things that I think we, we really delight in. It's those unexpected collisions of you know, art experiences and everyday experiences. Another uh, important inspiration, and this is a, a way we could kind of pivot to the current moment as well, is Paulo Freire and I mentioned a minute ago the idea of liberatory pedagogy or emancipatory pedagogy, education for freedom. Those are ideas that really come out of um, Freire's work in a lot of ways. And this quote is from a text in, published in the late 60s, originally in, in Brazil, uh, called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And uh, the book came out of many years of Freire's work in Brazil. Uh, some 
parts as an educator in private settings and some years as an education minister in the country charged with thinking about literacy education for agricultural uh, rural uh, poor communities who had no political agency or, or access to political power largely because they couldn't read and so issues of land and land rights were uh, issues they struggled with and couldn't kind of gain access to, to, to more power over their lives without literacy. So Freire was charged to set up programs and quickly realized that using the same materials and the same methodologies to teach literacy in this context um, wasn't doing justice to the learners and started into this work where he, that, that led to the pedagogy of the oppressed where he said, actually this whole system that's oppressing these people needs to be challenged in so many ways, including in how we teach. Uh, and so, so, you know, even classrooms can feel like authoritarian spaces when the teacher is totally powerful and the learners have no power. And that just sets up the, the dynamic that we're looking to break. So we have to actually rethink how we teach. Um, and he proposed uh, an alternative to what he called banking. Banking being the, the thing we're trying to overcome where banking assumes that the learner is an empty vessel and the teacher's just trying to pour knowledge in. And he said, actually that, that dehumanizes the learner, right? We, that, that, is, that discounts all of the wisdom that learner has when they're walking in the room. In fact, we have to take advantage of that wisdom. And so, um, writes really, really beautifully about how we need to rethink education to be a project of um, co-creating experiences and co-discovering um, uh, together the material, finding ways of, of changing the dynamic. Really aligned with that, you know, initial idea of Bill Strickland, right? We're, we're, we're together on this journey and I have more experience than you, so I have something to, sh to show you, but you might have some insights that I'm gonna learn from. So this is like a free idea. But then this quote, at some point he says, it's not enough to just say like, okay, here's the new system. We're gonna replace banking with this other thing. He said the unfinished character of human beings and the transformational character of reality necessitate that ongoing, education be an ongoing activity. And it's like, we, we're all unfinished as people. Reality is always changing and being transformed. So education is not a fixed activity. Like we need to kind of rewrite how we teach, what we teach at, at all times. And I, I kind of extrapolate out from that. And I think with, with the organization, you know, we don't have a fixed methodology either. It's not like, okay, now we play in Takarias, therefore, you know, we've got this, this methodology down for how musicians engage in community. In fact, no, like it's, oh, we always have to be attuned to what is the moment we're in. Um, as an organization with our educational approach, um, as the mission evolves. And this is just a, an example from a couple of weeks ago, you know, we're, as, as so many are, trying to reinvent what music making and music sharing looks like, community building looks like in the time of this pandemic. So we've got this um, stage that's a trailer that uh, we just attached to my car and we drove it around Providence for, for a week and did about eight concerts over the course of a week in different neighborhoods. And this is in an empty lot that CMW now owns that we're planning to build on. But we were also outside of the home of one of our alums. We were uh, just at a, at a sidewalk near the Providence's pedestrian bridge. We were outside of a nursing home. We were outside of a neighborhood bar, outside of a church. Um, yeah, and just trying to say like, actually, Maybe this is as simple as using Clorox wipes, wiping down chairs, throwing them back of the car, taking, taking them out of the next stop, setting up a table with jars of lemonade or rather the bottles of lemonade. Everyone 
gathers for a little concert, sanitize everything, throw it back in the car and go on to the next part. So it's been fun to kind of reimagine this approach a little bit for this, for this moment. Um, just kind of here, uh, pause for a second to go go back to the evolution of of CMW, and I think one one thing that's um, uh, maybe disingenuous about giving a talk and showing colorful pictures of the outcomes of the work. Uh, something that's problematic about that is it doesn't show the hard stepwise process of starting up. And for those of you who are exploring careers and thinking about how you'll make a life in music in the world and thinking about how you might start an enterprise similar to CMW, I thought it was useful just to, to talk through some of the steps that I encountered along the way. Um, and just to give a little character, char char characterize that a little bit. So, so uh, I grew up playing violin, viola, knowing that that was a p piece of my life that was really important and that I wanted to, to continue with professionally. Um, I went to Brown University, uh, not a conservatory. That was kind of a, a fork in the road for me as a high school student, trying to figure out if I would go to conservatory or, or a liberal arts school where I could pursue music in a different way. And chose that approach, though made music a, a big part of my life, both through opportunities in school and by studying with the teacher in Boston. And had an opportunity to apply for a fellowship from the university for graduating seniors to pursue a public service project. Uh, I proposed this project of a musician residency along the lines of what Bill Strickland did. And the first couple of years were so slow in, in, in sort of getting off the ground because, you know, I was figuring out what I was doing. And also there was this process, I really believe that there was this process of kind of making room in, the, in my life and in the life of the community for this thing to exist. And I would go, you know, in, in terms of fundraising and looking for grants and things, I would go to various people and say, here's this idea of a musician residency based around experimenting with uh, music education in a different way and having musicians have a viable career, teaching, performing, living, working, and being part of a community. And a lot of the reaction was, you know, well, try it out and if it works, maybe we can fund you, but not yet. Um, we have no idea if this could work. And, uh, and you know, there already is a community school of music and there already is a community arts center. So why do you need to do something different? Why don't you just join forces? All good questions. But it kind of took three years of work, um, working in partnership with a community center that had deep roots in that community, who were very welcoming to the project. And working, uh, doing some other freelance teaching and, and playing and, and still my own violin study and stuff. Uh, and gradually kind of over a few years developing enough of a track record with families and students and starting to do a few concerts that people are like, okay, this has been around a bit. Um, maybe we'll try something on. And there is this interesting uh, statistic that, um, is true, I think, of new businesses as well as new nonprofit ventures. That it takes three years of losses before you start to generate a profit. And in this case, it was like three years of a, of emotional and energetic kind of loss. Right? It was just like kind of burning the candle at, at both ends all the time to just try to get it off the ground. And after three years, it was kind of like, well, I'm not sure if I have the energy to go on. It's it. There's not a lot of money coming in. This is not easy. But it was this funny turning point where after after three years, year four, everyone starts to look at it a little differently. And I realized it's like as much a financial question as it is about um, uh, just the, sort of making space in people's imaginations that this exists. And going back to some of the same funders who were like, wow, you're still here. Yeah, like I think we could think about a grant. 
And so year five was really a, an accelerator year. And we, we rented the storefronts for the first time and were able to finally pay musicians on a small salary. So we weren't just hiring freelance musicians to like come in for their teaching or come in for a rehearsal, but actually $10,000 for 10 hours a week. That's what we did. And it's like those 10 hours we might, it's going to be a combination of teaching. It's going to be a combination of teaching, playing, rehearsing, and sitting around and just dreaming together. Um, and that was in 2001. So that number would be higher now to make it work for people, but gradually sort of building it up um, from that point. So I just wanted to kind of highlight the, you know, that sort of gradualness of those first years. Certainly not the only path. There are ways to accelerate that faster than I think what, what I and we did. Um, but just to point that out. Um, a couple more slides in closing, just to give you a, a flavor of some other projects, including uh, ones that are currently on the drawing board. And then I'd love to stop and, and open it up for dialogue and, and ideas and questions. Uh, I just love this picture. Uh, I include this just as a, as, a, as a great moment. This is actually a performance of that Fantasia, the salsa-based violin concerto, um, in a performance in the park. The orchestra, you can maybe make out, is a, is a mixture of students and alums and professionals on the strings. You can't really see it, but there's then a professional salsa band and, and uh, violin soloist. And these two children uh, spontaneously danced, and some photographer was awesome to catch it. Uh, and this is kind of like the thing we were imagining is like, how could this piece fluidly move between classical music concert, salsa dance party, and kind of community festival all at once. Um, it's kind of a beautiful day. Uh, this is a, a really fun project. We were able to commission a piece for triple string quartet um, and, and a group of students from Karim Rustam whom some of you, some of you may know, wonderful composer, um, and is married to one of our colleagues. And this was for the Kronos Quartet to join a quartet of our Music Works Collective professionals and a quartet of students who were on stage on the right there. And then the finale had a, a larger group of students join us. And finally, I would just um, share uh, uh, this most recent project, we're working on a new building for the organization. So much of our life popping up in various places is uh, intentional. We want to always be doing that. But there's also a part where we really just don't fit in the building that we occupy now to have lessons and any kind of performance. So we've bought, so the, the red is where we currently are. We don't own that building. We rent it. And the orange is this empty lot that we've bought that you saw in one of the pictures. And we are dreaming, uh, designing, fundraising for a building. Um, these are just, just sketches, uh, not formal designs, but that would, that would house a lot of the uh, education work that would be a kind of community gathering space, uh, what we think of as a home base for young people to gather, to have a place to come after school and practice, and for more um, formal but also informal collisions between our ensemble, our students, guest artists, and other community members, um, where now all of those things kind of have to happen in separate spaces at different times, but we're kind of looking forward to them colliding uh, more often. And one of the the project that I'll just mention briefly is, as we think about the history of this land uh, in, uh, in, in this neighborhood in the West End that has changed uh, dramatically many times over the course of 100, 200 years, um, we're really thinking a lot about how we honor the history of this land before and during and after building something there. And so we commissioned Xiaopong Lu, um, another wonderful composer, to write a piece based on a set of oral histories that she and a few others did about people's memories of this place. And bef beyond that, some research we've done about the indigenous history of this land and the 
the, the, the longer ago history with um, uh, different owners and different uses um, up to the most recent user, which was a, a gas station. And to, to kind of create a piece of music where students and our ensemble could, could perform as a kind of musical spiritual groundbreaking for the building, but also as a way to kind of say, uh, th th through music, how do we start to inhabit this place and tie it really deeply to the threads of, of what has happened there before? Uh, and and who has who has felt like it was theirs b before we got there? Last slide. I just love the gathering represented in this in this picture, uh, including the monsters in the front. You can see if you've ever been to Providence, you you you've probably seen big Nazo puppets. Um, they're kind of everywhere and they're amazing. But um, there's a picture. Famous picture called A Great Day in Harlem, 1950s, I want to say, on a stoop on 125th Street where some photographer assembled as many living great jazz musicians as they could for a photograph on a stoop in Harlem. And this was a, an event after um, a celebration we, we had. And we thought, you know, we've got a stoop and let's celebrate the, the community here. So that's just a celebratory way to end. So I will, I will stop there and stop screen sharing. And I think Liz will moderate some questions. So thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Um, so there are not yet any questions in the chat. So we can do this if people want to speak up or you can write in the chat or use the hand raising function. Um, but I think we could just sort of open it up at this point, right? So, does anyone have a question they want to ask? I'm seeing, or maybe you should raise your. Um, we could also do it by un unmuting, and then Liz and I will be able to see you. Right. Any of the any of the above. So. Okay, Rose, would you like to go first? Um, would you mind talking a little bit more about how you program concerts to be um, of interest and invitational to the community you're serving? Sure. It's a great question how we program concerts and I guess I have a few different answers to that. Um, one is we do, within the ensemble, we do a collaborative process for programming where on an annual basis, people are submitting ideas and inspirations that they think would be great for our ensemble to play. And sometimes those are you know, just passion projects of theirs. Sometimes they're things that feel particularly mission aligned. And the kind of guiding principles for submitting projects are that we are looking for as creative a way to um, honor as many voices uh, as we can. And so I, I'm always excited by the, the by the by the opportunities to bring together kind of canonical pieces with pieces that might be new or like genre crossing, like new music or, or genre crossing, or particularly highlighting marginalized voices of uh, composers who've been marginalized or communities have been marginalized in, in some like creative and thematic way. Um, so that's one answer, right? We're sourcing it with sort of these guide, guidelines. Another is as we have put a lot more focus over the last few years on thinking about representation in our concert programming, we've set the target for ourselves of 50% women composers across the season. 
and featuring Black and Latino composers in particular, but other um, com composers who represent voices in our community that are not as well represented in classical music. And I guess a third thing I'll say is, is something that's maybe more um, experimental now, uh, but something we're playing with is how are our community members helping to program music that they're interested in or would like to hear? And how could we support a community curating process? Um, we have a colleague organization in Cincinnati called My Cincinnati that has done some really beautiful work kind of developing a process for putting a, actually a budget together and then having a community conversation where um, people can talk about things they would like to hear and also be presented with a, a range of options that things they might not have known about and then have them really choose uh, a series of things they, they would like to have programmed and then have a budget available for them to do that and then the ensemble plays it so we're, we're starting to play with some of those ideas as well yeah uh, there are a couple more questions in the chat um eric do you want to ask yours It just was, uh, I know you said that the lessons were all free. So I was just um, made me immediately think who's paying for them. So uh, is it, is it grants or uh, how does that work? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's good. So I, I didn't talk about the mechanics of the organization as much. Uh, it, the budget for the organization is about 1.2 million annually. And most of that is it, contributed. So 60% um, or so is from individual donors and family foundations. About 30% is from grants, distinguishing between family foundations and, and um, more professionally run foundations. And then a percentage of that is from government, National Endowment for the Arts, State Arts Council, and a couple of other government sources. And then a smaller fraction is from earned revenue from concerts uh, and, and and other activities, but but largely contribute to revenue. Yeah. You probably have to have a, a, a staff member who's devoting them, them person who's to getting the grants and the that kind of thing. Yeah, maybe this ties to Rachel's question um, and you know, how many people on staff. We have um, a couple of colleagues who are really devoted to to, to the fundraising part of things. Um, one who's really focused on individual philanthropy, one who's uh, a consultant, not, not actually a full staff member, um, but who works on grant writing. And now that we're in a capital campaign, we have a third staff member who's Kind of supporting both while we have the extra work of raising a lot of money for the for the building yeah uh so so there are about 20 people on staff total evan do you want to ask your question uh out loud sure thing yeah apologies for the the wordy uh question but first of all to say thank you so much for uh, the presentation and for this incredible work that you're doing. But the, the question itself is about the spaces that you're creating and obviously with the sketches there, the ones you're hoping to create as these spaces for uh, not only performances and teaching, but uh, dialogue for a conversation, um, not only with the community, but the community themselves. And having recently learned about work that the Astor Gates is doing in the South Side of Chicago of taking um, buildings, whether abandoned or not, um, former banks and turning them into these public, semi-public spaces. Um, do you see them as spaces not only for formal events, but even just places to listen to music um, or conversation about music, something that isn't necessarily formal instruction or uh, formal performances? Because I love that idea that you had with the taqueria for, um, for performance and food and the kind of crossing of boundaries in these informal ways. Yeah, great thoughts. Um, uh, 
Well, one of the priorities as we're thinking about this building is that it is a space whose primary um, value or gesture is welcome and belonging. And I don't think that's going to be obvious or automatic to create. And part of it is just like the physical symbolism of like, what does it look like? And does it feel like an inviting space because of the way it's built? And part of it is how we live into it and who feels they belong there. But the whole point of it is really to um, amplify what we've hoped to create in our kind of disparate nomadic activities and in our storefronts, but to kind of like um, expand on those. Mm -hmm. And so food and music always go together. Like we learned that early on, like we always are feeding people. Like it's at any student event, there's snacks. At most concerts, there's food. Like it's just a thing. Like it's just what brings people together. Food, food and music, it's just right. Um, so there will be a little cafe, not necessarily one with a vendor who is always running it, but like it's there. The idea is it's there where we might have the Tuckeria folks come in and make and serve food for one event and a coffee vendor might come in in the mornings and so you know and do something else uh, so part of it is just having that kind of fluidity between food and performance and education and community space and part of it is also like making the community making the performance space a kind of flexible open and adaptable so that it is a space for a, a community meeting either one that we hold or that somebody else needs to put on. I'll just share one project we did several years ago, which was personally like really a highlight. And um, we had a grant from a, from a group called uh, Art Place America. And, and we decided to think about how, this was especially in the early 2010s when foreclosure crisis was at its peak and vacant and abandoned properties were like a huge phenomenon in the neighborhoods we're working in. And so the question was, how could we help to reanimate abandoned spaces and vacant spaces with musical events? And so we did a month long residency in a vacant commercial storefront, not ours, but a different one where we just had different events rehearsals, um, sort of an installation art project that went along with an electronic music performance, a late Beethoven quartet that was like several performances and several conversations. Um, and then one of, one of the things we did with that was we just printed, a colleague of, of mine printed a giant poster, which was a page of the Beethoven score and just hung it in the window. And there was this great conversation I had with this guy on the street one day who I, th um, I didn't know much uh, about him, but I think he was a resident in the building up above. And he got so excited. He said, I grew up playing the trumpet and I know how to read those notes, you know, but I haven't seen them in years. And, and he was like connected. We said, we'll come to the concert. And he, he like, he stopped in for a little bit and he got something and he, he left. He, it was kind of not about that, you know, but for him, it was just like, whoa, this music is showing up in my, in my building. And then the other project in that series we did was with a um, house that was kind of this crazy grand mansion that had been deserted for many years and, and was kind of in this state of disrepair. And, um, and we did a project where a quartet played in one room and my sister, who, who, who is a designer, worked with colleagues to amplify each instrument individually and have speakers in different rooms. So coming out of the old oven was the second violin and coming out of the heat register was the cello. And then there was a, you can kind of walk around the house. You can either hear the quartet or you could like walk around this crazy house and just like hear one instrument. And so you could kind of get inside this house and inside the quartet, which was, yeah, it was kind of a crazy cool evening. Um, and then one of the rooms was a chef making little food. So yeah, just ways to kind of always be thinking about animating spaces. Um, 
doesn't fully answer your question, but it's a it's an invitation for a much longer, fun fun dialogue. I'm sure. I see a few other hands. Um, uh, yeah, go for it, Sebastian. You can see it. Um, I think Sue had her hand up. Um, I don't think we hear you yet, Sue. You don't seem to be muted, but I don't hear Sue. Do, does it? No, maybe it's a microphone issue we're or something. Not, we're not hearing you. Do you want to type your question in, and I can I can respond to it. Should we do Why Alexis? Do Alexis, while you're waiting. And then um, I don't know. Okay. Hi. So, um, I was wondering if you faced any like really big major challenges while building this organization because I've I've always wanted to do something like this with my community like my neighborhood or the city I'm in but I'm from New York City so everyone's always cranky busy and stuff like that so I was wondering if you faced any challenges where people were complaining about um your organization um yes for sure um challenges at every step of the way uh I would say you know if you were to try to to get a project going in a major city like New York um, there there is such a crowded landscape that you know maybe it wouldn't be this you wouldn't maybe follow the same playbook as what I've just described but one thing that I'm really inspired by is the ways that musicians can have partnerships with unlike agencies so like were you to develop an uh, a partnership with a senior center or a youth center or a gardening center or a you know or a park you know it's like uh, one of one of the fellows we we have a fellowship program and and young musicians come and work with us as teachers and performers for two years and then go off and sort of launch their own work often. One of our former fellows launched a project in the Baltimore area at a senior residential um, center where her trio became a trio in residence at this residential senior center. And, um, and they've sort of built this program in some ways parallel to CMW in that they offer instruction and performance, but their students are people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, many of whom have <clears throat> a history of playing music, um, but in the kind of isolating years of um, their 80s and 90s don't really have opportunities to do it. And, um, and also just finding ways that music is therapeutic for that for that generation, uh, including like taking requests and, and bringing a trio up to somebody's apartment and just playing there. So it's been this really creative, interesting way that they are having a, an engaging life and career as a trio um, and they get to use the facility to rehearse. I think Lauren herself was, or maybe still is on the activities staff. So she has other responsibilities to, to put on events, uh, but then a portion of her salary is to just devote to her trio and the musical work they're doing. So that's an example. And I think that's really a totally different, but I think really, really cool and viable model, especially in a big city like, like New York. Like how might you partner with another agency to offer them something through music while they could offer you the maybe infrastructure and space that you might need to, to, do, to, to, to do some other things. Um, so I, Angela and Sue both have questions. Um, I'm not sure who was first. Sue, are, can you talk now? Is it working? Yes. Okay, sorry, I had messed with the settings earlier. Um, thank you so much for coming and sharing your experiences and processes. Um, and I like your whole Dewey thing and the, um, you know, emphasizing the experiential 
aspects of music. Um, I had a couple of questions, something I've been thinking about lately um, in the vein of decolonizing the classroom uh, and dismantling, you know, current hierarchy systems. Like, how do you approach that with students? And also, how do you like, um, we can't we can't deny that music music is inherently social and political. How do you teach that to students without teaching s politics to students? Um, I was just Great. curious. Yeah. Great. That that feels like the fodder for a great and much longer conversation. But let me see if I can just throw a few ideas in. Um, uh, one dimension of our programs that I didn't spend a lot of time on is our phase two program. So that's for teens. And it, they, as I mentioned, play chamber music together in phase two. But they also have a weekly dinner. And at least pre-COVID, there was a weekly dinner together. And uh, an hour-long discussion about social justice issues in their lives and communities and the discussions aren't specifically anchored by their connection to music they're really kind of wide-ranging but then at the end of every year they're challenged to put together a public presentation that brings together the themes from their dialogues throughout the year and musical presentations musical performances and I would say that's the most direct and explicit place where students are thinking about the social and political dimensions of what it means to be young artists and young, you know, residents, members of a city. Um, some of the themes over the years have really been tied to music. Uh, one, just after the 2016 election in, the, in spring of 2017, the theme they, they presented on was uh, silence as um, suppression and silence as power. And it was this really, really nuanced discussion and performance set of performances around like, what does it mean to have voice in turbulent times? Where are, you know, where, is, where does music play a role? And, and you can imagine some of the other directions that conversation went. Um, uh, so, well, that's, that's one, one response. The other, in terms of the actual, like, daily process of how do you challenge the systems of pedagogy, we've really did a lot of work to get as specific as we can over the last several years. Um, where one of the core elements is student agency, like how are students determining a part of their journey as musicians while not making the mistake of saying the students will guide all of their own learning because there's expertise and there's a sequential nature to string pedagogy that makes sense. Like we're not going to have it be a totally open um, universe for music learning, but also how do students have a meaningful how do they practice a sense of agency and self-directedness, even from an early age? And so we developed a set of benchmarks uh, that say, like, at a pre-foundation level, when somebody's just entering, what does voice and agency look like? And it, maybe that's just uh, about engaging in dialogue and having them feel a sense of confidence sharing their voice with their teacher. Like, maybe that's what success can look like that at that point. And then at a later stage, maybe success looks like um, that they are taking a song that they're interested in from family or from um, that, that, that they're listening to on Spotify and saying, how do I play this on my instrument? And then like kind of building that into a learning plan with their teacher. The teacher could say, well, cool, like you're not ready to play all the dimensions of that song, but like what if we were to arrange a part of that and we'll make that part of your year-end project? So that and I'm just using two examples, there, there could be many more, but we're just trying to really think about what what that 
what that aspect of student agency looks like at all the various levels. So I, I think I'll stop there, but I would love to continue that conversation and maybe we, maybe we can at another time. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think Angela has been waiting to ask a question. Hi, I'm Angela. Um, first of all, thank you so much for speaking about your organization. It's so cool to see your ideals come to life. I had a question about how um, you were working to adapt to the current digital climate, I would say that's being pushed, especially because of the pandemic, and how you might um, try to overcome the, act, the disparities in access to technology, especially whether it's like economic or racial or geographical, um, how you would, I guess, broaden your impact to the virtual setting. Great. Um, so we are pivoting to digital for most of our instruction, except in these warmer days, what we can do outdoors. We are doing some outdoors. Uh, and we have a grant pending with a local foundation right now to buy um, iPads, external mics, and hotspots to loan to students. Most students have access to the technology. They would need to do lessons remotely. In some families, there's not, there are not enough devices for everyone to be doing what they need to be doing concurrently, though. And so that's a barrier. Um, we have also tried to just help students understand and families understand what resources are available through their schools, where schools are offering Chromebooks and, and other devices on loan, right, while, while schools are on distance learning. So we try to be as much as possible, conduit to resources and information, and if possible soon also to have a little bit of a lending library where students could have access to technology that will support them in learning with us, obviously, but also maybe use that same technology for schoolwork. Uh, I think there's there are ways that this is hard, right? There's ways this is just hard and and not as good as, as the, obvious more intimate and direct experiences we can have in person there are also ways this is challenging us to reinvent things and one story i feel like that's particularly hopeful with one of my students is that uh, we've gone to this the system where she records something two to three minutes of something from her practice and texts that to me um, any, anytime she practices hopefully that's every day but however many days that is and then I get to listen and either respond in, in real time and give a few suggestions that can help her into practice. Or at the lesson, we can just sort of critique her recordings together. And that's something that was there. It was sitting there in plain sight, but we just never took advantage of before. But it was sort of pushed on now because of, because of this experience and the lessons can't be the, what they used to be. It's like actually become pretty satisfying as, as a way to build more student Kind of ownership that like for instance today in the same student's lesson we just went to one of her recordings from this week and we both just put ourselves on mute on the facetime call and just listened through her recording and made notes about what we each heard and then asked her to go first so she's there like in a kind of listener self-critique mode and um it was just one small example of the ways that i think we'll come out of this time with more more tools from technology than maybe at least I have taken advantage of before. Well, um, thank you so much, Sebastian. Um, you know, we could definitely, we'd love to just keep you here all night and, and keep asking you questions, but um, it's, we, thank you so much for being with us. It's been very generous and inspiring, so. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of your great questions. This has been really, really great to, to get to know some of you through these questions and yeah, I hope we can continue on at some other point. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Liz. Thanks for making this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.